who's excited? Forks up. And I heard three people like, woo. <laughs> forks up. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't come up with it. It's kind of a new thing. Fork, forks up. Yep. All right. Yeah, all right. Well, this took a turn, but that's okay. Um, let's, uh, let's start out in a word of prayer. Amen? All right. He's like, please pray. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to come together. Um, to to worship you, to uh, fellowship with one another, to have some fun this morning. God, we ask as we uh, as we worship you that it's not just some songs that we sing, that we uh, are intentional at our praise and our worship, and that it's for you, the one true King. God, we ask that you would soften our hearts this morning, help us to set aside the distractions of the day to day, and help us to focus on you and what you'd have for us this morning. Be with Pastor Robbie. He's had an awesome opportunity throughout the week to share the gospel in several different settings. And God, we just ask that you would continue to encourage him and give him and all of us opportunities to, uh, to share the gospel in our communities and uh, just give him the confidence to, uh, to share boldly this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, we're getting better. There was a lot of amens with that one. There we go. All right, you join, join with us this morning. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. Oh, these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and its soul. Let's take a minute and say good morning. Amen, amen. All right. 
Young men that are helping with our offering this morning, if you could come forward, please. Here, fishy, fishy. I like that shirt. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for today. Thank you for an opportunity to worship you through our giving. God, we're so excited about the things that you've been able to accomplish through us uh, here at your church. I um, ask that you would uh, help us to give generously as you've given to us and that we would be good stewards of the funds and use them to your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
we're thankful that when our soul cries out to you, that you're, you're just constant and listening to us, God, that you draw us close, that you make your presence feel known. God, we ask that this morning as we bring our requests to you, as we bring our praises, as we bring our prayers, so we bring our hearts to you this morning, God, that you would just bring us up close, hug us tight, let us fill you this morning. It's in Jesus' name. never failing let mercy fall on me and everyone needs forgiveness the kindness of a savior Be seated. Good morning, church. If you would open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 14. Luke, chapter 14. The title of today's message is Prayer and Fasting, Humbleness and a Focused Heart. It's our last message in the series on prayer and fasting. 
But it might be the most important because we get to see the application of a humble existence and a focused heart as we long for the Lord in this world. And we see that in an interesting manner because Jesus Christ is in a social setting and he is reclining at the table because he was invited to a very special banquet, a party, a shindig, to use the Texas term. Anybody ever heard of a shindig before? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Texans like our shindigs. Christ is at a shindig, and, and throughout his time with these folks, he decides as he watches some important people take their places at the seats of honor, he decides to share a little parable. And he begins to share some of the challenges that humans have with wanting to be in a place of importance. So we begin our message today with the text from Luke chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 7 and read several verses. Then we'll backtrack to verse 1 here after a while. But Luke 14 verse 7 says this, Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. Then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Verse 10 says, but when you are invited... Go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher, then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What is happening here in verse, verses 7 through 11 is what happens each and every day in our lives in society. We find ourselves in positions where we have to choose social norms. And I happen to work <clears throat> in a setting with people who have no social norms. I work with high school students. And if, if you think that you work around some adults without social norms, you need to go hang out in a high school classroom. Not just that, a Title I high school classroom, a, a classroom with students who oftentimes lack parenting, uh, stability, the basic essentials required to exist in a, a society of typical middle class prosperity that other countries are not rewarded with and blessed with in such a great land as America. Many of these students will just walk up and ask you for something without any kind of a clue that it's not appropriate to do it at that time, which is kind of refreshing in a sense. I mean, in a way, it's kind of refreshing for people to walk up and just blatantly ask you for whatever it is that they want. Because as you grow older, as many of you in the room know, you have to be careful when you ask it, how you ask it, why you ask it, the words that you use to ask it, the manners by which you use to ask it, okay? My parents growing up, I would get thumped in the back of the head if I asked something at the wrong time or in the wrong tone and with the wrong cadence, the wrong words, if I didn't act loving, if, if I didn't say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, that kind of thing. I would get thumped in the back of the head. A lot of my students have never said the word ma'am or sir in their entire life. Now, in my class, I direct them that way. By the end of the year, many times they know that. They shake my hand at the beginning of class when they walk in my door. By the end of the year, they'll look you right in the eye and shake your hand. Good morning, sir. Good to see you. I say, good morning. Good to see you, ma'am. It makes a difference. But that doesn't change the crux of society, which is, I want what I want, and I want it now. The difference is, those who are more, more cultured and culturated, we just do it in a much more sneaky way. Right? We, we do it in a way because we've had to be conditioned to get what we want in very particular manners, in very polite manners, many of us in the room. 
But Jesus says, hey, there's an ongoing problem and I'm going to tell you about it. But let's not forget how this started. In 14.1, it says one Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So in 14.1, we get the background to how Christ ended up with this special dinner in the Pharisees. What does it say on the Sabbath, one Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler? Now, I want to point to the word ruler, even though our passage isn't focused on 14.1. The word ruler is archon in Greek. It's, uh, it's, it's this word that, that's like, that's where we get the word arch. The arch ruler, the main ruler. This isn't some mid-level uh, leader. This is the leader. And somehow... Christ is invited to sup at that table. One of the most fascinating studies I ever did in seminary in Christology focused on this passage. Why in the world would the Pharisees want to invite Jesus Christ to their dinner? That's like inviting me to Buckingham Palace and asking me to eat uh, fish and chips with the queen. I'm going to screw that up. It's not going to be good. I nearly got arrested outside of Buckingham Palace for standing in the middle of the road taking pictures one day as the processional was coming down that fancy road. I couldn't understand the English uh, accent that they were yelling, get out of the road. I had no idea what they were telling me and finally an officer grabbed me and pulled me back. We don't know what to do in certain settings and surely they would have thought to themselves, do we really want Jesus Christ of Nazareth this, this guy that we call the, the rebeller, this, this one that does things at the wrong time, out of order, uh, outside of what we consider to be tradition, the man who's countercultural, who has no possessions, no essential home, who calls disciples to follow him and give up their careers. Do we really want that guy to come sup at our table? I posited in that research paper that I believe they felt like they had to invite him. That they would have had to invite the man who's causing an essential revolution in the eyes of them and politicians. They had to invite him because he was the next great thing. Therefore, Jesus is sitting at their table. And if that's not enough, Jesus doesn't sit there quietly. He's in ministry. He's in ministry mode. He's He's making his way into the prime of ministry in the time that he has here on this earth. And if you look at verse 2, it says, And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. He had dropsy. He had a foot that did not function right. He had something that was paralyzed that did not function right. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. Now, folks, you know what the higher class folks were thinking. It's the Sabbath and we don't work on the Sabbath. It's our tradition. And because we don't work on the Sabbath, no, you don't heal somebody on the Sabbath. Of course not. The Jewish would never do something like that. But what does Christ do? He asks the question first. He already knows their answer. But he asks the question first. And what does it say in verse 4? They remain silent. Sometimes the silence of our hearts says all we need to hear. And it says it in a blaring volume. Sometimes whenever we don't speak, whenever we don't respond to the gospel, whenever we don't respond to Jesus, whenever we don't respond to culture in that moment, sometimes our silence is more powerful than our yelling. Sometimes that's good or bad. Sometimes in society, I believe Christians should have spoken up. They should have spoken up and yelled, no, we will not do that. They should have spoken up and said, no, America, this isn't right. They should have spoken up and said, we don't agree with what the Supreme Court said. We don't agree with what this politician says. We don't, we don't agree with uh, the Crusades in the past against uh, Islamic faith and all the, the merciless deaths. We don't agree with this. We don't agree with that. We believe this is wrong. We believe this is right. 
Sometimes Christians need to speak up. But in our pacifist mentality, oftentimes, that also aligns with a cowardice mentality. If you're going to be a pacifist, it needs to be at the time when cowards are not pacifists. And if you're going to be outspoken and aggressive and defensive, it needs to be at a time when cowards would never be aggressive or defensive or offensive. That's what the gospel calls us to. It's to doing the right thing at the right time. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen? But what happens here? They, may, they remain silent. He took him, the person with dropsy, and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how Jesus Christ made his entrance with a bunch of famous, smart people. He drops down at the foot of the table, most likely, looks around at all these important people, finds a man with dropsy, and heals him on the Sabbath in front of all the special people. And then he asks them a question that they wouldn't dare answer in public because they all know that they would do exactly what he just did even though they're about to stare at him with anger and bitterness and hate, Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He was countercultural. Welcome to the biggest party in the land. Be, please be seated. Jesus spots the man, the least of these, the lowly who needs to be healed, heals him and challenges the Pharisees while he does it. That's the background to why Jesus is at this shindig to begin with whenever we begin in verse 7 today. So then he tells a parable. That healing, folks, was the preface to this parable. Because what does it say in 7b? When he noticed how they chose the places of honor. He's watching how they're seating people at the master's table, at the arch leader's table. And he's watching how this happens, and he sees an opportunity. He sees an opportunity for teaching, for learning, for the gospel to be taught, the way of man to be challenged. And he says in verse 8, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. Picture what Jesus is describing. When you walk into a shindig, to use the Texas term, and you plop down at the place of honor and you don't deserve the place of honor, or you don't know that that's your particular place of honor, be careful where you sit because you're going to force the master to come by later when someone else arrives who deserves a higher place than you, you're going to force that person to walk up to you and say, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir, do you mind moving to a lower place? This person is deserving of the seat that you took. How embarrassing. What a moment that would be. That's the parable that Jesus is beginning and launching into here. This is the first thing I leave you today, that Jesus honors the humble. He honors the lowly. He doesn't honor the master at the table. He doesn't honor the person who decides I'm lowly, but I don't deserve that spot, but I'm going to take that spot. I'm going to sit at that spot. I'm going to act as though I belong at that spot. I'm going to take that spot because I believe I've earned that spot. I deserve that spot. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to sit upright and I'm going to act like I've been here before. That's not the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is, whenever you walk in somewhere, don't take the highest spot. That's what he's saying. Why? Because Christ honors the humble, the lowly. This points to the social norm that many of us in America don't understand and follow. In America, everybody dreams of being a Carnegie, a Rockefeller, a bush. Everybody dreams of, of being a 
a son of Bill Gates. Okay, maybe not me. A little too West Coast, perhaps. But everybody dreams of the bank account of Bill Gates. How about that? I would love to be able to give away half of my fortune and still be worth $275 billion. Oh, what the church could do with that. You think that's high. You think that's rich. God owns it all. You see, Christ, Christ says, hey, hey, table, listen to this. Listen to this parable. Don't walk in and take something that ain't yours. Why? Because in your circumstance, you just put the person of honor in a terrible predicament. They have to humble you. They have to humble you. Now, let's look at verse 11, just a, a few verses later. Actually, let's look at verse 9. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. Then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited and go and sit at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Look at the contrasting views. One person walks in, plops down at a place he wasn't invited to sit at. Master has to walk up and say, excuse me, sir. What does Christ describe? The shame of standing in front of the dinner party and walking over and sitting at the lowest of places. Probably not even at the main table. The word shame. It insinuates the focus is now drawn on you, but it's not exalting you. It's drowning you, humiliating you. Christ didn't bring that on you. The world didn't bring that on you. You brought that on you. And Christ points to you as the problem. You chose to humiliate yourself by attempting to sit at a place that wasn't yours. You were uninformed. You were assuming. You were prideful. But instead, Christ says, don't do that. When you walk into a room, whenever you walk into the place of fame and fortune, everybody's around that means something, sit down at the table where you're the lowest position, the lowest standing. You don't know who you're sitting among. And then allow the master to walk in and say to you, sir, excuse me, do you mind standing? We have a higher place for you to sit. Imagine the feeling of that compared to the feeling of shame for having to move. One of my buddies had season tickets to the Houston Rockets whenever we were young. <clears throat> Lifelong best friend. To this day, if you're watching Joe, sorry for this story. He watches on occasion. And the tickets that he and his dad had were up in the nosebleeds at the old uh, Coliseum before Lakewood took it over. And we would go sit up there. It was a great game, good seats. But about halfway through the first quarter, he would look over, he'd say, Rob, he called me Rob. Let's go down and get us some better seats. And I mean, when I say we went to a lot of games, we went to games like almost every week as a season ticket. I'd say, Joe, not again. He had no shame. And I constantly worried. We would go sit on the second row, right behind the bench, and he would talk smack to the other players. And I would sit there in constant fear for the remainder of the game that some rich person is going to walk up and say, boys, you're in my seat. And we're going to get booted. And his dad's going to lose their tickets. I had these fears. Joe had no shame. He'd say, if the times that that happened, he, he jumped up, shook hands with them, introduced himself. I'm gone. In shame. <sighs> going back to the nosebleed. Joe's like, where are you going? Let's just move down a couple seats. Not a big deal. To this day, he's wired a little bit like that. Now he'll tell me, hey, dude, just relax. I'll tell him, hey, be humbled. <laughs> Come on, man. 
And in reality, there's a little bit of both. Do you know you're important? Do you know you're valuable? Yeah, in the name of Jesus you are. Do you know that you were created by God? Absolutely, but that doesn't entitle you to go to a station that you don't deserve. Plop down and say, I'm here, everybody. I am awesome. I'm going to be on TV today. I got no qualifications. I got no understanding of what I'm supposed to be doing. But I'm here and I'm awesome and I'm going to deserve this because I exist. Now I sound like a politician. But in all reality, that's the way some people are wired. Other people say, I don't deserve this. I don't even deserve the lowest station. I, I don't deserve to even breathe. I don't deserve to even be here. Now that might go a little too far the other way. Maybe we need to be in the middle. Whatever pride we do have is because Jesus Christ saved me. It's because Jesus Christ sustained me when I woke up this morning. It's because Jesus Christ allows us to meet right here, right now, to worship and exalt His name. By the way, y'all were singing it out today. You might not have given an amen on the farmer fork. But y'all were singing. I looked over at Sarah. I said, honey, listen to him belting it out. I got teared. Chill bumps right now explaining it. It was beautiful. By the way, Miss J, the fork is the hay fork. It's the hay fork. It's the fork of the devil. No, just kidding. It's the hay fork. Yeah, that's what that is. Farmer Joe, big swole Farmer Joe with the overalls. But I digress, as Sarah would remind me. So you got these contrasting viewpoints. You've got the one who takes the seat that he doesn't deserve. You've got the one who sits at the place he doesn't deserve because he's way higher than that and he probably knows it, but he's unassuming. And some of the greatest relationships in our world involve those two people, like my buddy and I. You offset each other. A lot of marriages might even be like that. But in reality, what does Christ want from us? Well, let's continue in verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And get this next part. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Notice he doesn't say, and the one who allows God to humble you. I believe that happens to each and every person on planet earth. Whenever we get haughty in spirit, whenever we uh, exalt ourselves above, whenever we are prideful, I believe God humbles us, absolutely. But I believe man, in our decision to sin, is where the pride comes from. We think we can get away with it. We think it's not a big deal. That's the third thing that I leave us today. The sin of pride is the Achilles heel of humanity. That's what Christ is really talking about. The prideful man walks in and sits down at a place that he doesn't deserve. The humble man walks in and sits at a place that he probably feels like no one deserves. He probably feels like no one deserves any kind of separation and hierarchy. The foot of the table. You know why they call it the foot of the table? A lot of times if the floor was unlevel, it would slope towards the foot of the table. And if you think of the word feet in ancient culture, they were absolutely disgusting. They weren't street sweepers that spun on concrete and swept out all the debris. The livestock, the equine, would spread feces throughout the road. And you walked either barefoot, if you were the lowly, or with strapless uh, sandals, or with strap sandals if you had a bit of prominence. Your feet took that on each and every day as you walked. And then you didn't get into a 60 PSI shower with 17 shower heads and adjustable neon lights and music playing on your Bluetooth and you scrubbed your feet. You, had, you didn't have a whirly bird with a, a diamond bit to scrape your heels, ladies. Right? You, you got into a river. You got a basin of water from a well and pumped it at best as time went on. But in reality, you lifted it up by a rope with a pail that probably had holes in it. And you did your best to clean your feet and they were still dirty by today's standards. The foot of the table was where people sat that didn't have status. 
They would have been honored just to be at the table at all. If you want to relinquish your pride, put your heart in the setting of, Father, I do not deserve a relationship with you. I'm honored to have one. Just allowing me to sup with you at your table of glory. I don't deserve that, Father. Thank you. That's what Christ is talking about. Letting go of the pride and just being grateful to be at the party at all. But we want more. We want something else. We want something we don't necessarily deserve. This is exactly what got Lucifer in trouble. Lucifer, as you might remember, we see in Ezekiel, Lucifer was created for glory and beauty. He was the most beautiful. And if you look in that passage in Ezekiel where you see this description of how Lucifer was created and the glory and beauty that he had that encompassed his existence, it names off all of these gorgeous stones that were also created when he was created. It compares him to just the, the awestruck nature of, of these gems. And then what does it say? Then Ezekiel says, you were blameless in your ways, Ezekiel 28, 15, from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you. Pride. Pride. Lucifer chose to be his own God. Isaiah 14, 12 continues in this description of the downfall. It says, You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. What lofty words to describe the pride of Lucifer. I will make myself like the Most High. That was the heart of Lucifer. He wasn't happy being this gorgeous creation of, of cherubim that looked like gems and stones. He wasn't content in having his place of honor. He wanted a higher place of honor. He wanted to sit at the head of the table. And what did God do? banished him. He banished him. Or as Ezekiel says, destroyed him. Destroyed him. There's a story I found about this lady who needed some wood chopped. She couldn't do it herself. She sees this man walking down the road as an African American fella. She grabs the man and says, excuse me, I need, I need some wood chop. Do you mind helping me? And he looked a little bit lowly, plain. Looked like maybe he needed some work, some money. So he came over into her, her yard there and <clears throat> rolled up his sleeves and grabbed the axe and went to chopping. He chopped up all the wood, split all the wood, took care of his business started taking it into the home and the woman's daughter started smiling and giggling. And the woman kept looking at the daughter, rebuking her. Like, where are your manners, young lady? And when the man left, the daughter said, Mama, that man's famous. She said, quiet down. <laughs> Y'all ever been there before? Hey, Mom, Dad, shh, hush, boy. I don't want to hush. You know, parents, sometimes we get locked into our own thing. She said, that's Booker T. Washington, Mama. Booker T. Washington, the, the great teacher, educator, president of Tuscaloosa, uh, Tuscaloosa Academy and of higher education, the, the one who really changed the South in education for African Americans and was also a pioneer in many other areas. That's who she asked to go chop wood. In her unassuming self, she was actually very assuming. 
there's an African-American fellow, and I'm going to grab him to help chop me some wood because he's going to be willing to do manual labor and need the money. In reality, Booker T. Washington was worth five times what she was worth. She saw him later on, and she came up and said, I need to apologize. And he said, no, 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 no. I enjoy some manual labor from time to time. It humbles me. She said, well, I want you to understand your humility made me really consider the lack thereof in me. We all need to be brought down to earth sometimes. Or maybe the right way to say that is we all need to be brought up to heaven sometimes. Sometimes we need to encounter people who humble us. So if you run with friends who are high-flying, high-fluting, made of money, driving the latest, greatest automobiles, they can buy anything they want, anytime they want, but they are prideful, be careful, it's contagious. We start thinking, we deserve that, I deserve that, I need that, and I need that, and you're under me, and I'm over you. Christ never carried himself like that until it came to the judgment of sin which is supernatural. But as far as the stations of life, we see today exactly how Christ looked at the stations of life. He did not care how much money you had as long as you love people with it. And He did not care where you sit at the table as long as the Master wasn't shamed because you sat there and had to be asked to move. Because what was it about? What did Christ start the chapter with? The well-being of others. You don't think he knew he would be rebuked later on, accused later on of working on the Sabbath? Of course he did. That's why he asked his question. Do you believe it's wrong to heal on the Sabbath? That's why Christ did that. He knew what he was about to do. Then he said, if you have a problem, if your son or daughter has an issue, would you not pull your oxen out of the ditch, to use the modern translation? And they remain silent. What does this tell us? The application here is their silence showed their own pride. Their silence showed their own reluctance to sit at the foot of the table. I might even go so far as to say they didn't want one of their guests mingling with the lowly with dropsy anywhere involved in that banquet. We're too good for that, they thought. That's what the world tells you. That's what Satan tells you. All the things you've done, you don't deserve to sup with God. You don't deserve to be saved with Christ. Christ is too good for that. All the things you've done, no one will ever understand. You know people know what you did. They'll never believe that you've been transformed. What are they saying? I'm better than you. I deserve to be at that table. You don't. But guess what? They haven't given their heart to Jesus. Today, you have that opportunity. If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, there is a seat at the table for you. And it's a seat that you don't feel like you deserve. I know that feeling. But He's calling you today. <laughs> he's calling you today. Trust upon the Lord. Believe with all your heart. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. And today you can have a relationship with Him. Pride cometh before the fall and we've all fallen. But today, today maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior but you feel so unworthy. The things you've done, the mistakes that you've made, you still struggle with the guilt, the pain, the conviction. You've never allowed yourself to feel forgiven for the things that you've done. We've all been there. We, we've all struggled with those decisions or the consequences that follow those decisions. And today, right here, right now, you can have freedom for the things that you've done. Final liberty. The strings can be cut from the things that you've done. You know, some of the freest men that I've ever met 
were sitting in a jail cell in Honduras serving a life sentence in the most deplorable of conditions. They would never see the light of day again. They would never experience human freedom like we experience right here, right now. But yet they praised the Lord as though they were sitting on top of Mount Everest breathing the purest of air and as though they had the most gorgeous of room to sleep in and the most beautiful meal to share. And they were in a five by five with no bed and a five gallon bucket to use the restroom. And 150 degree heat in the summer. No AC. I mean, uh, AC. How do you have that liberty, that freedom, sitting in jail? Because they fully know that they are free in Jesus Christ. And today, you might be in this room living in American liberty and freedom, but your soul is battling because you haven't been set free from the things of your past. Today can be that day. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I do thank you for liberty. But Lord, I thank you that when we realize our pride, whenever we focus on the things of the Lord, as Christ pointed the Pharisees to, that the things we've been working on the last number of weeks, the prayer, fasting, devotion to you, focusing on you in ways that we haven't done in recent memory. Lord, all of a sudden, the things that come into view, into focus, are the things that matter. So today, Lord, I pray that the things that matter are the things that we will concern ourselves with. The things that we would worry of are the things of you. And Lord, for each person in this room today, we have different issues in life and different relationship problems, different finance problems, different health issues, different concerns. And Lord, today, may we lay those things aside and may we just focus on you. During this time of worship, Lord, I pray that you would do business in our heart. Allow us to focus only on you. May you be the thing we long for. And may you be the thing that we worship and adore. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you would please stand as we sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter.
Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stay. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Amen. What a great song. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. Let's give the Lord a hand clap this morning. I'm going to ask Miss Bethany and James if you guys would come forward. They come to, this, to us this morning from Preston Trails uh, Baptist Church in Frisco, Texas. And they have been visiting for several weeks. They feel that the Lord is calling them to transfer their membership to Trinity Baptist Church in Farmersville. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Woo! Both James and Bethany have both been uh, baptized by immersion. They asked this morning that we accept them into our fellowship by transfer of letter. I'll entertain a motion at this time that we accept them into our fellowship. Mr. Ronnie gives the first, and uh, Matt back there in the back gives us the second. All in favor, say amen. amen. Any opposed? You're buying lunch. <laughs> All right, let's give the Lord a hand clap. So I'm going to pray for them as we close, but I'm also going to ask if you would come forward this morning and extend the right hand to Christian Fellowship and just let them know how excited you are that they uh, feel called to join our fellowship. I'm excited for them. I'm excited to see what God's going to do through them. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Bethany and for James. Lord, I thank you for leading them here. I thank you for this season in our church body, the season of growth. Lord, I, I pray that you put the right people here at the right time for the right purpose. And we believe you're doing that. But Lord, I pray today that you would ordain our steps, that you would illuminate our steps that we take. And Lord, I pray that as you stretch us, as you grow us, that the world would be changed, not because of the name Trinity, Baptist Church, but because of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you're doing that. And Lord, I praise you and I give you all of the glory today. It's in the name of Christ we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on forward and give them a hug and a handshake.